This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. I'm the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. And I am joined this week via phone, of course, by the editor-in-chief of MDH Hematology Oncology, Dr. David Henry. Dr. Henry, we have part two of our conversations with Dr. Alana Yerkowitz this week. But before we get to that, I want to mention congratulations to you and your family. There's a wedding that you're attending. Oh, yes. I practiced my father-daughter dance. Uh, I was told it better be right. I feel like I'm on Dancing with the Stars. And uh, the speech, apparently, if you look it up online, your father's speech should be seven minutes or less. Mine's down to six minutes. So I'm nice. re- ready to go. All those meetings that you've attended over the years. <laughs> yes, you, you appreciate a punctual speech. I, and I appreciate the fact that you appreciate that. Indeed. All right, so let's get to this week's episode. Uh, Dr. Yerkowitz, of course, does such a great job kind of removing herself from the picture and thinking about the difficult things. She writes the column for MDH Hematology Oncology called Hard Questions, and she is, of course, the voice of and the producer of her segment, Clinical Correlation, which is the human side of hematology oncology care. In part two of the conversation, last week, if you will remember, uh, the question that was answered by her and the Residents that work on this this program that read the show notes, Dr. Emily Bryan, Dr. Ronak Mystery. Their, their question last week was, Doctor, how long do I have to live and how to answer that? The question this week is, how to recommend that there's no more curative therapy and to move on to next steps when the family and or the patient wants to continue curative therapy? Well, she keeps picking really difficult, not infrequent conversations. You're What I'm picturing in this segment is, you're sitting with a patient and family and the patient doesn't look so good, has had first, second, maybe third line therapy and responded or progressed and really has not much to fight with. And the family who wants to lose a loved one says, well, you know, what's next? And you begin this conversation that the toxicity may easily outweigh any potential tiny benefit. And of course, people say, well, we'll take the tiny benefit. But you, then you look at the patient, he or she looks really sad. And often as this conversation will probably get into Making the decision to just do symptom management, no more active therapy is very relieving, and everyone seems to be relieved and get on board, and people then live the rest of their life in comfort and dignity. Yeah, and I, that's something that I, I, so I started my writing career in medicine in oncology, and I really learned, we got into palliative care and uh, learned a lot about that process, and I found an interesting study, I believe it was 2014 or 2015, where uh, physicians who were surveyed would opt for that kind of care earlier than patients would. And I found that fascinating and telling where you you understand what goes along with these, uh, we'll call them Hail Mary uh, curative techniques and they're not great outcomes and the adverse events are so intense that the physicians were choosing to to take that route uh, much earlier on in their care. And I found that very telling. And it can be just as difficult on the physician. You've often cared for this patient maybe years and they become really special and your friend as well as your patient and you have a problem. I will be in a situation sometimes where a partner of mine will cover a patient on the weekend and say to me, what are you doing? This patient looks terrible. Have you had this conversation? Well, I thought maybe one more thing. And then you get a reality test and you know, of course you're right. We should have a really serious talk. Right. And that is what uh, they're going to be discussing. And if you're a fellow or a resident, that's one of the things where you kind of, I imagine it goes through your head during medical school and, and different rotations, but then having to be a part of the team that delivers this message and makes that decision um, really important. We hope uh, any young attendings, residents, fellows, or even med students get a lot out of this conversation today. Agree. It's a tough discussion. and It's a good one to hear about. Okay, so let's go to this week in oncology. And I picked an article that is news and it's being reported out of Boston by MD Edge, our reporter, uh, Jennifer Smith. Jennifer does such a great job. Um, along with our topic today, there is a study that finds there's no standard treatment for discontinuation in myeloma. And this is uh, no standard of care, no clear pattern for discontinuing treatment in multiple myeloma. This is according to a speaker at the International Myeloma Workshop. Like I said, that was in Boston. And you and I were talking beforehand. This is such a complex disease, so many lines of therapy. It's this, it's this, it's this. And then you also mentioned that uh, this is the case for a, a lot of diseases. Yeah, it's, it's just exploded to taking myeloma as, as this next topic. Uh, it's just exploded the therapies we can have. When I'm a fellow, the survival was two years, and now we often talk cure, and the more difficult patient who has gone through several lines of therapy has many more lines of therapy that can be effective. I just happened to be listening to a lecture today. Speaking of Boston, Dr. Paul Richardson is a thought leader in myeloma and investigator and 
wonderful speaker, and he was talking about this very topic of how to mix and match these various therapies and keep things going for quite some long time. So there is no standard of care in when to stop and when to discontinue therapy, myeloma, and it comes up in other disorders as well. Absolutely. So the presenting physician and researcher, Dr. Katya Weissel, said that a planned end of therapy only accounts for a small proportion of treatment discontinuations, especially in the relapsed setting. Patients are discontinuing treatment due to reasons other than relapse, ultimately receiving fixed duration therapy. And you know those are the kind of conversations that uh, I guess proceed what will uh, what Dr. Yerkowitz, Dr. Breyer, and Dr. Mystery will be talking about. So if you want to read more about anything coming out of International Myeloma Week from Boston, you can find that and much more at MDH Hematology Oncology. Uh, and that's you know Dr. Henry's website, Editor-in-Chief. Indeed. And now proud, you're, you're proud, proud of it. Proud of it, but not quite as proud of being Editor-in-Chief of uh, a wedding that's coming up this week. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> more to follow on podcast to yeah, come. Yeah, we, yeah but stay tuned for part two the weddings are always so so enjoyable well thanks for hanging out with me and uh again congratulations from all of us at md edge all the different uh families here that to to your family that's very great news thanks nick thanks very much all right coming up next dr alani yurkowitz and dr emily Breyer and dr ronak mystery this is blood and cancer Welcome to part two of this special edition of Blood and Cancer. I'm Dr. Alana Yerkowitz. These conversations are difficult and important to understand, so I thank you for joining us again this week. If you missed part one of the conversation, you can find a link to that episode in the show notes. If you have any ideas or comments on the conversations we have in these episodes, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can email us at podcasts at mdedge.com. We may just include your thoughts in a future episode. And if you're looking for more content like this, you can check out my column, Hard Questions, at MD Edge Hematology Oncology. Thanks again for joining. And now, Dr. Emily Breyer and Dr. Ronak Mystery. So the second case, another really common situation is the the theme of it before I even read the case is a situation where you as the physician don't recommend any more uh, cancer directed therapies, but the patient and the family really want them. So the case is you are the consult fellow for a 60 year old man with aggressive metastatic sarcoma. The cancer has progressed through multiple lines of chemotherapy and most recently immunotherapy. Unfortunately, the patient's course was complicated by multiple small bowel obstructions for which he is hospitalized again, severe cachexia, and TPN dependency. He has now become so frail he spends most of his day in bed and feels exhausted just trying to get up and walk across the bedroom. He has previously expressed that he wanted to be as aggressive as possible in, quote, beating the cancer. You notice that when his children are around, they remind him that he's a fighter and encourage him to keep fighting through this. You discuss his situation extensively with the primary oncologist who's out of the country at the moment, but agrees that she does not recommend any more chemotherapy and she instead recommends hospice, which confirms your own instincts. You try to discuss this with the patient and family, but they become very upset and continue to emphasize that their dad is a fighter. What do you do? So is this, is this a situation that either of you have experienced or something similar to this? Absolutely. I think it's, it seems actually that it's quite common um, just within our own residency, the experiences that I've had, Ronak, I don't know if, if you feel similarly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. I was actually, this sounds like, you know, just another day on a hemonc rotation for us, to be honest. Hmm. And what, what in particular do you feel like makes this, makes this so challenging? I think it's challenging because cancer is such a, such a horrific thing and such a life altering thing that, you know, everyone wants to, to beat it and no one wants to suffer with cancer. No one wants to see their patient suffer with cancer, but 
there comes a point um, when the therapies have a toxicity and the, the risk of that toxicity may overweigh the, the chance of benefit for that therapy in someone with refractory disease or, you know, multiple relapsing diseases. And as a, as a physician with, you know, the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, you have a responsibility to your patient to, to tell them that, um, and be honest that the, the risks and the toxicities associated with the therapies at this point seem to outweigh um, a possible benefit. Hmm. I, I, I completely, I completely agree. I, and, and I think that, um, I think that we are in a kind of a difficult situation. I think that this problem is a difficult situation for us as physicians because we see both sides. I mean, on one side, you absolutely hear and you acknowledge everything that the family member is saying about their family member. And you realize that it is coming out of a very good place and um, them wanting to do everything possible for their loved ones. But at the same time, we also know the theoretical and the actual side effects of all the medications. And we've seen people go through it. And you having, you know, some understanding of this just really, really wouldn't want someone in this patient situation to have to go through with that. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard, especially because, like you said, in this situation, we're the fellow on consult. We are not the primary um, we don't have that long established rapport with this individual already. And that just makes this so much more difficult. Right, right. I think ideally in this situation, the primary oncologist would have been having continuous goals of care conversations with the patient. And it's possible they were, and it's possible they weren't. I mean, often they were, and it, it still doesn't even stick when someone just has a certain mindset uh, about, about beating it no matter what and fighting through it. So, but I completely agree coming in as the consult fellow where you don't have a relationship with the patient and the family makes it so much harder because then their attitude is kind of like, who are you, who are you to deprive? They see it as depriving me of this therapy that could potentially save my life. And so getting even a little more specific about this, you know, you were saying, Emily, that uh, kind of w one way you could phrase it is that the risk of toxicity uh, outweighs the benefit. But, you know, I've been in so many situations where the patient can come back at you and say something like, well, who cares about risk of toxicity if this gives me a chance to live? You know, living is the most important thing to me, even if there's a 1% chance of this chemotherapy working and giving me more time. I'll deal with the side effects. I'll deal with the nausea. I'll deal, deal with the diarrhea. I'll deal, deal with whatever, you know, comes at me. I just want to live. Uh, how, how would you respond to something like that? It's such a difficult, it's such a difficult conversation. And I, you know, I completely understand everything that you're saying. Um, I think it gets down to, you know, what do you mean by live? You know, what's, what's the most important thing to you and what are your goals, which kind of goes back to what we were chatting about earlier. Um, I think people have different different definitions of, of what it means to live and some if they knew that they would be you know, in a hospital or unable to eat or unable to interact with their family may not may not want that um, and others others may. So I, I think you know as long as you have a frank and honest discussion with the patient um, and you're not going to harm them, I think it's it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. There's not really an easy answer. Right. I think what you're saying about clarifying goals is is incredibly important because when when you get in this type of situation often you know you're not on the same page as the patient and the family you're using different terminology so when you say something like chemotherapy will not work what, I mean what does work mean what are the patient's goals what do they want do they want to live as long as possible do they want to live as well as possible and often it's somewhere in the middle so yeah so some phrasing that I've used before, you know, let's say I've done that and then I've gotten the person's goals and they say, I want to live as long as possible, or, you know, I want to have as many good days as possible. Uh, I think explicitly saying something like chemotherapy will not help you live longer or better. Uh, I've just, I've, you know, I've uttered that statement directly and I found that can, that can land uh, a, a, a bit better than talking about risks of side effects because then, like I was saying earlier, you know, they can come at you with that they'll deal with the side effects and 
like come at you. I don't mean that in a negative way. You know, it's just understandable what they're, yeah. what they're trying yeah, to absolutely. do. Yeah. And so you want to be in line with their goals. So if they want to live as long as possible and the chemo actually will not help them live longer, in fact, it can make them live shorter by, you know, quickening their demise. You can say that explicitly that chemotherapy will not help you live longer or better. And the other point that I wanted to ask you guys about in this um or, or rather bring up is I think uh, using the proper language uh, is incredibly important. And like I was saying earlier, making sure you're using the same terminology and being on the same page as the patient and the family. So one common pitfall I've seen is people will say something like uh, that we're not going to do any further treatment for the cancer, but you know, palliative care is treatment. And I think using it's important to make sure that you're using the proper language and you can say something like cancer directed therapies will not help you live longer or better. And our focus now is on treatments that will uh, give you as many good days as possible and help you feel as well as possible during them. Any thoughts about that? Completely agree. And you've been in situations where those statements have been made by providers. And just as you're saying, um, it gives the, it, it still provides hope. You're not taking hope away saying that, you know, you're withdrawing therapy and that's it. It's just kind of a, a shift of, a shift of focus, I think, and a kind of a shift of goals and a shift of mindset, which can be helpful for preparing the patient and the family for what may be to come. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one thing, the last thing I'll mention about this, that Ronick, you mentioned earlier, actually, I'm not sure who's Ronick or Emily, one of you mentioned that you know the the patient's family absolutely has their best interests in mind, mm-hmm. and one thing that I found helpful too is to say that explicitly and to commend family member. You know, even if you're in the middle of a difficult conversation like this and it can feel antagonistic, the goal of the family is really just to help their dad. You know, to help them to help him do what he wants to do, which can be as live, live as long as possible. So being explicit and commending the family, you know, saying something like, I can tell you care really deeply about your dad and you just want what's in his best interest, uh, that can establish an alliance with, with the patient and family too and cool things off a bit if it seems like it's antagonistic when you're just walking in, you know, for the first time in the middle of this. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I think that Emily and I probably have seen this more in the context outside of, of you know, cancer itself because in the hospital, we're dealing with so many other things right now other than just just oncology patients, for sure. And I can tell you that whenever I've used that sort of phrase, it's really made a big change in the demeanor of, of you know, the people I'm interacting with. Um, and again, it kind of, it helps us unravel the true um, goals and, and aspirations of everybody involved. And I think that that's huge. <laughs>